Colorado's elected leaders are banned from accepting large gifts. Why was an $800,000 gift okay? Another dumb question. What are you guys trying to do here? Dark money pours into a town's elections in a fight over oil and gas drilling. We're driving into debris season in Glenwood Canyon. That's a problem. While much of the front range is under a red flag warning, that doesn't really tell you anything. Maybe there's a better way to alert Coloradans that our state is primed to burn. We'll get into it on Next. Colorado's elected leaders have to abide by a gift ban so that they can't line their pockets while in office. Today, our Marshall Zellinger got a donor to admit what could be the largest gift ever given to a politician in Colorado, $800,000. Election denier Mike Lindell says that he gave that money to fellow conspiracy theorist Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters while she runs for Secretary of State and fends off felony charges. Steps away from taking the stage at the state capitol for Lindell's rally today, he also got served with a lawsuit for his election rigging claims. What is this? Sir, sir, what is this? And that's how you get served. Lindell is facing a new lawsuit from Eric Coomer, Coloradan who works for Denver-based Dominion Voting Systems. Lindell, of course, has claimed without evidence that Dominion rigged the 2020 presidential election against President Trump. Coomer is suing for defamation after Lindell accused him of treason. Polling shows a majority of GOP voters still believe the big lie that the election was rigged. Lindell's election deniers rally featured Republican candidates for the U.S. House, U.S. Senate, and the star of the show, Secretary of State candidate Tina Peters. Election integrity is their buzzword. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger had some questions about ethics, law, and integrity. Please help me welcome Tina Peters. Support comes in many forms. On the steps of the state capitol, there were signs and cheers for Republican Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters. She faces felony charges accused of tampering with her county's election equipment. She also has to answer to an ethics complaint accusing her of accepting more money in gifts for her legal defense than an elected leader is allowed by the state constitution. Marshall Zellinger from Nine News. I'm just curious about the ethics complaint and your legal defense fund. Do you know how much was in the fund before the website was taken down? You just get right to the right to yeah. the <laughs> I'm here for no. That was that was something set up uh, by uh, uh, my past attorney, so I don't know have any knowledge. Support for Peters comes in the form of the pillow guy, Mr. Lindell. How much have you raised for Tina Peters' legal defense fund? I I, I just put all the money in myself. How much so, is that? I don't know. I probably put in three, four, five, maybe eight hundred thousand of my own money. Unless you're a close friend or family member of an elected leader, you're limited in how much you can gift. You can only give someone a gift of $65 per calendar year. Jane Feldman was once executive director of the Independent Ethics Commission. Now she's part of the legal team in the ethics complaint against Peters. And if Peters receives more than she's allowed, she could be fined twice the amount. So if Lindell really gave her $800,000 to pay for her legal defense, the fine could be expensive. That's $1.6 million. But there is wiggle room if Lindell is a close friend. Except listen to how he answered a question about flying Peters around on his personal plane last year. I'll give rides from people all over the country. I had never met Tina Peters. That's what the plane ride you're talking about. She came to the cyber support with the group from Colorado. I picked people up. I invited all 50 states. All 50 states were represented. There's your answer. Another stupid question by a stupid journalist. But here's why it's not a stupid question. If you had just met her, you weren't a close friend of hers. I just met her that day. Another dumb question. If he said he had just met her and they had no prior relationship, it's very hard to argue that he was a personal friend. Ultimately, what the Ethics Commission will have to determine is, was any gift to Peters based on a personal friendship or the person's political or elected position? I could rewind 20 seconds and answer that question and think that it's probably because of the person's political or elected position. Yeah, I was about to say, you, you have to believe that that tape is going to get played in the Ethics Commission when somebody asks, were you close friends with her? Almost, it reminds me of the old Ron White joke every time Lindell talks about this, where he says, I had the right to remain silent, but I didn't have the ability. Uh, the man just keeps talking in a way that is like legally imperilous to his friends. I he. He thought it was a stupid question because he didn't like the line of questioning, but you can see why it's not stupid because it goes to what you will have to argue in at least this ethics complaint. And he said other things that could come into problem in, into play with Tina Peters' legal 
issues. But yeah, when you're saying one thing and there's a state law that says, oh, that fits in this criteria, that's why it's important. If mm -hmm. you're going to keep saying that, it's problematic for the, pre for the person that you're trying to protect. Uh, and before we go, the other stuff they talked about up there today, the other election rigging stuff, was there any new valid information or was it more of the same bat guano? No, no new information. No new information. All right, very good. Marshall, thank you. If you do not live in Erie, there is a good chance that you didn't even know that there was an election there today to pick a mayor and trustees in that town that's right on the Weld uh, Boulder County line. The amount of dark money that is pouring in to influence Erie's choices in the election indicates that oil and gas interests certainly see a lot at stake. Here's Steve Staker. It surprised Erie mayoral candidate Kelly Zuniga at first that someone on the outside would set up an independent committee to support her campaign. But then again, well, it surprised me that you were paying attention to it. There are two so-called independent expenditure committees registered to support Zuniga and other candidates with similar ideas. IECs allow groups of donors to spend money on independent campaigns for a particular candidate while not donating directly to that candidate. One IEC is a coalition of home builders in the metro area that spent nearly $10,000 advertising for her and a candidate for trustee. The other, a group called Erie for a Strong Future, set up to support Zuniga and a slate of candidates for trustee. A group that as of the latest filing through March 26th, hadn't spent any money on the race yet. I honestly don't have the foggiest notion who they are. They do that entirely on their own. They can't, in fact, it's a rule. They can't even have any contact with a candidate. And so it's not anything that I was aware of until it sort of happened. Zuniga's opponent, Justin Brooks, says there's an agenda, waivers to oil and gas regulations. I believe the objective here is that if they're able to elect a board of trustees that is sympathetic to oil and gas interests, they will be able to lobby COGCC to uh, allow waivers. He says he didn't expect so much outside money in a local race. We have uh, tens of thousands of dollars being poured into this election, and it's not about local issues, it's about special interests. They like to turn everything into oil and gas. They think I drink it for breakfast. Um, they absolutely have no understanding of who I am or what I stand for. Zuniga says she isn't necessarily for or against oil and gas operations in Erie and will make decisions independently. Well, I don't define myself for or against any industry. There was a third independent expenditure committee involved here, a group called the Better Jobs Coalition. They sent out mailers to Erie voters to remind them to turn in their ballots. That group is led by conservative donor Rick Enstrom. Problem is, they actually listed the wrong address for the voter drop box on that flyer. Enstrom tells me they realized the mistake. It was a staffer who made the mistake, saw it on a website, sent a corrected flyer to everyone who got the first flyer. Uh, but they were not registered with the town of Erie because they were simply doing a get out the vote drive. They think that they or they have legal precedent that they do not have to register since they weren't exactly supporting a candidate. And, and Steve, is this one of those situations where we're only going to find out after the election that some outside group poured in an enormous amount of money? I remember, I remember years ago in a Douglas County school board race, you had national teachers unions swearing, no, 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 we're not involved, we're not involved. And then you saw the filing months after the election that they dumped in a boatload of money at the end. It's interesting because this Erie for a Strong Future was set up in mid-March. It has spent no money and it has brought in no money. Uh, and everybody thinks maybe in that last week before Election Day, before the May 5th filing, that they'll spend some sort of money. I was told by the registered agent today that her client chose not to spend money on this race. So there you go. They're holding it for their strong future. All yeah. right, Steve, thank you. New report out today shows an enormous backlog in criminal cases in the Aurora Police Department, like 1,200 of them. The report is coming out just as conservatives on city council are trying to push police chief Vanessa Wilson to resign. This new report says that there should be less than 50 cases backed up at a time in APD's records department. The department can't keep up with processing reports, which then allow officers to go and follow up on cases. And this is not rinky dink stuff. These are serious cases, murder, crimes against kids, carjackings. Chief Wilson's attorney said today that the release of this report is mudslinging, saying that those backlogs has, have existed for years in Aurora. The city manager, Wilson's attorney has previously said, is trying to push the chief out, said in a statement, quote, ongoing system vulnerabilities still exist. We can and must do better. These are not failures that have occurred overnight. 
CDOT's getting ready for mudslide season in Glenwood Canyon, where a lot of rain means that the easiest way to get west and east across Colorado can suddenly close. CDOT announced today that it is almost done with the debris removal from last year's mudslide into the Colorado River. There's your before and after of what it looked like at Blue Gulch. Mudslides on the Grizzly Creek fire burn scar shut down the highway a number of times last summer. Workers have spent months clearing out the mud and debris from the interstate and from the river and trying to fix the ruined asphalt and concrete. Next, they move on to removing the rocks that were caught by rockfall fencing, trying to get loose rocks off the canyon walls. All of this is on a deadline because you've got spring runoff coming in the near future. The U.S. Forest Service says that wildfires like the one there in the canyon can cause up to five years of extreme debris flows on slopes. And we're just two years removed from the Grizzly Creek fire that burned in 2020. The Forest Service says last year's debris flows that closed I-70 over and over truly were unique because of the huge amount of rain that fell in one area quickly. They point out that it wasn't the hillside itself that came down into the canyon last year. The slopes held. It was loose debris on top that came down. The Marshall Fire could end up changing the way that fire weather alerts work. The drivers, hands-free on their calls but still online on their phones, are missing the point. The state could soon make it illegal to be on your phone while driving at all. And Colorado's favorite animal soap opera gets some new youthful energy. That's next. A legend in Colorado politics has passed away. Gloria Tanner was the first African-American woman to serve in the state Senate. Following her retirement from elected office about two decades ago, Tanner, who's a Democrat from Denver, set up a foundation to help prepare black women for leadership roles in our state. Gloria Tanner was inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame in 2002. A fast-moving storm bringing extreme fire weather to Colorado and gusty damaging winds. Red flag warnings remain in effect. High wind warnings remain in effect. We've had gusts over 100 miles per hour along the foothills. West to northwest winds will continue 20 to 40 miles per hour tonight with gusts to 60. So red flag warnings remain in effect for high fire danger. Humidity levels 15 to 20 percent. The low pressure system races to the Midwest. High pressure comes in behind. But if this gradient stays so tight, we're not going to get a lot of relief from the wind until probably sometime tomorrow. Only isolated showers are expected tonight, and we're looking for the temperatures to stay in the 50s until about 8 o'clock. We have a calmer day Thursday and a nice warming trend heading into the weekend. A bill making its way through the state legislature would toughen the law against using your phone while driving. So, you know, there's a law against texting while driving, but not tweeting while driving or any other kind of equally distracting typing while driving. Current state law bars anyone under the age of 18 from using a mobile electronic device in any way while they're driving. But right now, if you're an adult in Colorado, you can use your phone. You just can't get caught texting. The new bill sponsored by Democrats would tell all drivers to put down their phones. It does come with a few caveats. You could still use your phone to report an emergency. You can use a phone if you're a first responder or a utility worker responding to an emergency. And you can use your phone while behind the wheel if you're parked. The bill passed a committee test today. Well, it's on everyone's mind. You know, everything is very fresh and we're adapting as we go. This day of strong winds reminds us of the day that a thousand homes burned. The conditions that day weren't enough to trigger a fire warning. So maybe we need a different warning system. That's next. Pretty much all of Colorado east of I-25 is under a red flag warning until at least 9 p.m. And it could be tomorrow, too, with the winds. There were no active fire weather warnings in the Boulder area on the day of the Marshall Fire or for the NCAR Fire just a few weeks ago. Because of those fires, the criteria for those warnings in our state could change quite quickly. Meteorologist Chris Bianchi explains. Today's wind and dry weather might be a tad familiar. Winds gusted up over 100 miles an hour in parts of the mountains and over 70 miles an hour in Boulder, prompting a red flag warning. A red flag warning is basically a fire weather warning. 
It means that a fire could easily start and or spread in a short amount of time. Now, they're issued in coordination by the National Weather Service with input from Predictive Services, another government weather agency. From a public-facing standpoint, folks need to know for preparedness and prevention. Colleen Haskell is a wildland fire meteorologist with the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center's Predictive Services Unit, and she explained why red flag warnings are not always the right fit to get the message out about wildland urban interface events like the Marshall and NCAR fires. It started in the wildland and ended up in the urban interface. So it's not exactly a wildfire per se, but it's all important in looking at what this preparedness does for getting the message out for people. So there were no active fire weather alerts during either the Marshall or NCAR fires because the criteria for issuing one wasn't met. The criteria is based on a combination of wind speed, recent rain or snow, and relative humidity to figure out the level of fire danger. We're in conversations right now in the post-fire environment from the events that occurred um, and having sit-down discussions with the National Weather Service and Predictive Services in sort of massaging what might be a shoulder season event and what that criteria might look like, how we can message things better when it's not what folks expect for a traditional fire season. All of this is to say the next urban wildland fire could have better warning in the future. For next, I'm meteorologist Chris Bianchi. We're told that those formal conversations about adjusting fire weather warning criteria are going to start later this month. Colorado's most dramatic family on wings has a new arrival. Nest watchers report that the Stanley Lake bald eagles now have an eaglet. The mama eagle was seen trying to feed the recently hatched eaglet. These are photos from the Stanley Lake Regional Park Facebook page. This is the eagle family that was on the live eagle camp for the longest time. That's how we have followed their saga. You know, the male companion was originally linked up with another lady eagle, but then the new one came to town and drove off the original woman. So then she and the male checked up in the nest, and then last May, catastrophe. Tree split down the middle, nest collapsed. They then built a new nest deeper in the wildlife refuge. They are no longer within sight of the live camera. It'll be another week or two, <coughs> pardon me, before any eaglet peeks over the nest rim, so it's still unclear how many are in the nest, thought to be between one and three. Allergies are kicking my backside today. <coughs> it's a sign that humor is always a way to make an anti-war statement. That and your feedback next. It's a sign. Colorado's dogs stand, apparently squat, with Ukraine. Babette was in Lacamora Park in Broomfield when she spotted this sign on the dog poop bin. Putin, complete with Vladimir's picture. There's some additional resistance happening in Fort Collins as well. Same joke, different trash can. Rick snapped this picture for us at the dog park at Twin Silo Park. So be like Babette and Richard. If you see a sign that you think the rest of Colorado should see, email to next at 9 or tweet us with the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. Oh, Carol did not care for Marshall Zellinger's interview with my pillow guy Mike Lindell, specifically the part where Marshall got him to admit that he had given $800,000 to an elected official in Colorado that he didn't know very well. Carol said, "You sounded like a lawyer trying to entrap the my pillow guy." Carol, I'll say this: just because somebody sticks their tongue into a bear trap doesn't mean it's our fault. Marshall asked fair questions and got some surprising answers. We'll see you next time.